Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 179. Please turn to it. Page number 179. The very first problem that you see there in the second column. Problem number 193. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 193, we are told that we have a coin. 193, we have a coin. Or perhaps we don't have a coin. We have a coin that is being tossed three times. We are going to toss a coin three times. And the question simply is, what are the odds of, what are the odds, what are the odds that we will get at least one tail, at least one tail. We might end up getting two tails out of the three tosses. It is also quite possible that on the three toss we get uh, we get tails on all three of them. But the question here is what are the odds that we will get at least one tail? Well, what we have to first understand is that, let's first get the notation right. So we want to get at least one tail, which we're going to, uh, which we're going to repre represent with, uh, with the probability of getting at least one tail. Let's call, let's use letter T for tail, and we want T to be more than or equal to one. The, the, the odds of getting at least one tail, which means t has to be one or more, it could be two, it could be three, it could be just one. This represents the odds of getting at least one tail. And this odds of getting one tail, this odds of getting one tail is equal to one minus the possibility, the odds of getting getting heads, getting no tails. One minus the odds that t is going to be zero. In other words, we do not get any any tails at all. Uh, we do not get any, any any tails at all. The odds of getting at least one tail is one one, which is one hundred percent minus whatever the odds are of getting no tails at all. For probability, the odds of getting no tails at all is same as saying, is same, this, thing, this thing is probability of getting no tails at all, is same as the probability of getting three heads. Well, if we get three heads on the three toss, we're getting no tails. So that's what that is. This is the probability of getting three heads. Now, what are the odds of getting three heads? If you toss a coin three times in a row, what are the odds that you will get head on the first toss? Whether you get a head or a tail is the same odds, which is 50%. The odds are 50% that you will get a head on the first toss. What are the odds that you will get a head on the second toss? Well, the odds of getting a head on the second toss has absolutely nothing to do with what happened in the previous toss. Because these toss do not have any memory. These are called, these are what are known as independent events. The odds of the probability of one event taking place one given event taking place has absolutely nothing to do with what happened prior to it. So the odds of getting ahead in the second toss is again 50%. And similarly, the odds of getting ahead on the third toss or tail on the third toss, but we are interested in head, is again 50%. So if you toss a coin, if you toss a coin three times and if you get the same side three times in a row, all three heads or all three tails, those odds are one out of eight. 1 out of 8. Half times, half times, 5 is 1 out of 8. And therefore, 
the odd that you will get at least one tail is simply one minus the odd that you will get no tail or three hairs, which is which is one eighth, which is one eighth right here. And therefore, our answer that we're looking for is eight eight minus the one eighth, which is seven eighth. The odds that we will get at least one tail is very high, it's very likely, it's almost guaranteed, well not almost guaranteed, but 7 8. Do you understand? That's what it is. That's how simple it is. Let's go to the next one then. So this is the one tail. Is that what the question was asking? Listen, whether they were asking for at least one tail or one head, the answer is not going to change the same thing. The odds of getting at least one tail is the same as the odd of getting at least one head. It, it doesn't change. It's 7, 8. Because the, it's just a mirror image of each other. Just give me one second here. Let me see what they, what they were asking for. At least one of the, one, at least one of the tosses of the coin will turn up tails. So I did actually set it up properly. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 194. In 194, in 194 we are told that one-fifth of the class had A's. We are also told that one-quarter had B's. And we are told that one-half had C's. We are further told We are further told that the remaining ten, remaining ten, had these. The question simply is, how many students do we have? That's all it is. How many students do we have? Let's find out, shall we? We know that the remaining amount is ten. Ten of them got these. But we are told that one-fifth of them got E. One-fifth is same as 20%. 20% of people had A's. We are told that one-quarter of them had B's. One-quarter is 25%. We are further told that half of the class got C's, which is 50%. If you add them all up, you find that this is 5. Make sure that you don't end up this one. 2 plus 2 is 4. 95% of the class, 95% of the class had, high, had, had a grade of either an A or a B or a C, which means the remaining 10 that we see here, this 10, must represent 5% of the class. This 10 people who had D must represent 5%. Of course, they, have, they must have gone on to tell us that there, there, was, there were no Fs given out. What is Of the final grade received by a student in a certain class, one-fifth are A, one-quarter are B, one-half are C, and the remaining 10 grades are D. You see, and the remaining 10 grades are D. There are no F, there are no other grades. The remaining 10 grades are Ds. It's right, it says right here, what the hell? It says the remaining 10 had Ds. So this 10 represents the 5% of the class. If you were to multiply both sides by 2, that would imply that 20 represents 10% of the class. 20 represents 10%. Well, if 20 represents 10%, again, if you multiply both sides by 10, 10 times 10 is 100, so 100% 100 of class, 100% 100 of class is 10 times 20, which is 200. I don't know why I switched the sides, don't ask me why, I didn't mean to do that. That's it, there are 200 kids, 100% so of the class is 200 people. 100% of the class, the whole class is made up of 200 people. How do we know that? Because we just found out that 5% equals 10, if 5% equals 10, then 10% 10 must equal 20. If 10% equals 20, then 100% must be 20 times 10, which is 200. In questions of these natures in the real exam, we really shouldn't have to waste our time picking up the pencil and actually doing anything out. Just think logically and it's right there. It's very simple. Save your time for, for, for a problem where you actually need to do the work. Of course, I have no choice but to do it on the blackboard because I can't just stand here and flap my gums, obviously. I have to do something on the blackboard, so that's what we do it just for the sake of formality. But there wasn't actually much here to do at all in terms of paper and pencil. Do you understand? Very simple. 
five percent is ten, ten percent is twenty, therefore ten percent will be twenty, or ten percent is twenty, hundred percent will be two hundred. Number nine one ninety five. Number 195, we are told that as, as, as x increases from 165 to 166, which, which, must, which must increase. And this is what is known as a 1, 2, 3 problem. A 1, 2, 3 problem where they give you three statements, Roman numeral 1, 2, and 3. Listen very carefully, okay? In a 1, 2, 3 problem, in a 1, 2, 3 problem, most people have this nasty habit, I found out, I, I found out that most people have this nasty habit where they sit down and they analyze each one of these three statements individually, separately, and they work through the entire problem, all three of the statements, and then they've come up, come up with the right uh, proper combination that the thing is uh, uh, that they arrive at, and then they, at the very end they wait and uh, wait and see which of the combination that they are uh, which of the combinations that are given in the answer choices matches with the combination that they arrive at. Don't do that. These are one, two, three problems. It's very straightforward, very simple. Work on one statement at a time. Get rid of the impossible answers. Work on the next statement. Get rid of the impossible answers. And if you don't have the time to work on all three of the statements, then, then raise your odds. To whatever you can raise 50 50 or one out of three and just pick one and move on or once in a while it is quite possible once in a while it is quite possible that one of these three statements actually i should say once in a while that is actually the norm i i, I retract that statement they give you three statements and typically okay i'm rephrasing the whole thing i'm re i retracted the other statement that i just made in a one two three problem typically one of those three statements is actually more difficult than the other two obviously by definition it's a tautology Obviously, all three of the statements are not going to be of the exact same difficulty level, obviously. So, one of the, if there are three of them, one of them has to be the easiest, and one of those three has to be the hardest one. I typically tend to save the hardest one, the most difficult one, until the very end. So, if second statement turns out to be the most difficult statement, if the second statement turns out to be more difficult for me, I just skip it. I will go to the third one. And I look for the right combination and raise my odds. Do you understand? Let's do it together. Enough of the talk. Let's do it together. What does tautology mean? I said, of course, one of those three statements has to be the most difficult one by, by, by definition. And that's what a tautology is. Tautology is something that is true by definition. I'm looking at here in my list of uh, vocabulary uh, words. It turns out that we never learned about tautology. Well, we did learn it. Day number 38. If you are interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in vocabulary, uh, GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day number 38, and learn that word. You will learn that word along with some other useful and good words uh, to help you get a better score in the English portion of the exam. To, not, to say nothing of the fact that learning these words for just for the sake of learning is actually a good idea. Don't worry about the exam. Just you want to improve your vocabulary. You want to improve your language skill, obviously. The word was tautology. Tautology is something that is true by definition. And what I said was, of course, uh, true by definition, so, so it was a bloody tautology. Uh, there are three statements, and uh, they are not all of the same, same difficulty level, so therefore, by definition, one of those three has to be the easiest one, and one of those three has to be the most difficult one. I usually skip over the, the one that gives me more trouble, and I go to the easy one first. Let's take a look at it. Enough of the talk. We, we talk too much. Statement number one. Statement number one says, 2x minus 5. What do you think? Do you think that as x goes from 165 to 166, this thing is going to go up? And just because they tell you that it goes from 165 to 166, does not mean that you have to actually keep it as 165 to 166. You could actually tell them to go f themselves and make up a smaller number. Make it up. Instead of, instead of going from 165 to 166, ask yourself what happens when x goes from 2 to 3. Don't plug in one. One is not a good idea typically to plug in. Avoid the one because one behaves in a very unpredictable way. And of course, don't plug in zero. You understand? Uh, one behaves in a very uh, unpredictable way. For example, if you're dealing with x squared, well, then you're screwed. Don't plug in one because it's not going to evolve. You understand? So if you go from two to three, if you go from, it's very obvious. But I only be don't I'm explaining too much for no reason at all. If you go from two to three, when x is equal to two, four minus five is negative one. But when x is equal to three, six minus five is positive one. The question is, as x increases 
from 2 to 3, which must increase. Does this expression increase in value when x goes up? Of course it does, because negative 5 appears in both of them. Negative 5 is going to appear in both of them. So first time around, you're multiplying it by 2 times 165, and the second time around, you're multiplying it by one, uh, 2 times 166. So you go from 2 times 165 to 2 times 166. Of course, this thing is going to increase in value, because negative 5 plays no role, it appears in both of them. The first statement was actually very simple to analyze, very simple to analyze. Again, in real exam, we wouldn't have done all of this out. We just look at it and we realize that it go, it go, it is, it's going to go up, which means the correct, which, which tells us, which in turn tells us that the correct answer, whatever it is, the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain numeral number one in it. A, B, C, D, and E. Let's see what we can do with that information. B says three only. B says three only. Well, we just found out that statement number one works fine. Statement number one is true. That, that this expression does go up. This expression does go up as x increases from 165 to 166. This expression does go up in the value, which means the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain number, Roman numeral 1 in it. B says 3 only. Of course, B is not the answer. E says 2 and 3. 2 and 3. It doesn't have 1 in it. 1 works. E cannot be the answer. Let's look at second statement. Now we're going to look at second statement. Again, second statement, if it turns out to be pretty straightforward and simple, we're going to work. We're going to keep working on it, working with it. But if it gives us something, if it's, if it's something that gives us trouble, we're going to skip over it. We'll go to statement number three. Okay? Let's just take a look at it. The statement two says it is one minus one over x. That actually is also very straightforward. Why is it very straightforward? Because here, this part here, in the first case, you're going to have one. Think of, again, think of, let's, let's, let's not make it too complicated. Don't think of 165 and 166. Think of two and three. So first time around, the first time around, you're going to have 1 minus 1 minus 1 over x. x goes from 2 to 3. 1 minus half, which is going to give us half. And second time around, it's going to go 1 minus 1 over 3. 1 minus 1 third is 2 third. Did the, did the value of this expression, did the value of this expression go up? Did the value of this expression go up as x went from 2 to 3? As, as, as x went from 2 to 3, did the value of this expression go up? The answer is yes, it went from half to 1, it went from half to 2 third. The value of this expression did go up from a half to 3rd, third, third, which also tells us that the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain 2 in it. It also must contain 2 in it. Let's look at the answer choices one more time. Let's look at the answer choices one more time. A says one only. One only. Well, statement number two we just found out works. It cannot be one only. It cannot be one only. That's it. I'm going to actually go back and actually fix something. You might think it is silly, but I'm going to fix it because I'll feel better. I like to stay with my system here. I do not know why I did that because I was too busy talking. So I'm going to go back and stick with my system here. What I do typically, okay, this is just what I what I stick with my system is that first time around, I cross it out like this. B and E are going. Second time around, it's A that is going to be going. And now I put a second two crosses. Two crosses tells me that this tells me that it was a second round. Do you understand? Let's move on then. What else can we cross out? Is there anything else? If there is one more answer choice, if there is one more answer choice that we can cross out between C and D, then we're done. Let's see what one of the answer choices says. C says, uh, C and D. C says 1 and 2. 1 and 2. And that we cannot cross out. We cannot cross out because we just found out that 1 works and 2 works. Let's see what D says. D says, now you see D does not say 1, 2, and 3. The only way, the only way D could also stay is if it says all three. If it all if it says all three. In that case, three number statement number three is also a possible candidate as being correct. But D says, D says one and three. It does not have two in it. It does not have two in it. That's it, we are done. We are done. Answer choice D is also wrong. 
because it doesn't have F2 in it. We just found this between two works. And therefore, the answer is C. The answer is C. That's it. That was the end of it. Now, as far as the exam is concerned, As far as the exam is concerned, we are done. But we are not doing, taking the exam right now. Nobody is typing us. We are not here to take the exam. We are here to learn the material, to begin to sharpen, to hone our math skill. And for that purpose, we are going to carry on actually and analyze the third statement just for the sake of learning. But before we go to that, before, before we go to that, I want you to understand that we plugged in, we replaced 165 and 166 with 2 and 3. Had you left it here at 165 and 166, 165 and 166, what we need to realize, what we need to realize here is that 165, 1 over 165, because it is a smaller denominator, is actually a bigger fraction than 1 over 166. And the reason why this quantity, this quantity is smaller is because here we are taking 1 and we are subtracting a bigger fraction. 1 over 165 is a bigger fraction than 1 over 166. So it's 1 minus a bigger fraction the first time around and then it's 1 minus a smaller fraction. Which is exactly what we saw when we did 2 and 3. Because first time around we subtracted 1 half, the second time around we subtracted 1 third. You see? But you don't have to make it so complicated. Make up your own numbers. Take a customized exam. Like I said, Go tell, uh, go tell them to uh, go, go uh, tell them to go, go f themselves. You understand? Take a customized exam. Take some liberties. Okay? Don't be don't be like a puppet. Cut the string. Okay? Let's look at third statement. I'm not suggesting. As, I'm not going as far as to say that you should use the four-letter word. Never, 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 never. What I'm suggesting on the other hand is that we should use a nine letter word. Tell him to fornicate off. Do you understand? Number three. Number three tells us one over x squared minus x. One over x squared minus x. Again, we're doing it simply for learning purposes to see what's going on here. This can be written as one over x times x minus one x can be taken out as a common factor. As you can see, x times x is x squared, and x times negative 1 is our negative x. I should have made a mess like that, now I have to rewrite it. And what can we do with that? I shouldn't have done that, because now... The question is, where do we go from here? Well, what we go is here, this is what we're looking at. Let's look at it here. 1 over x times x minus 1. Now we're going to go from 165 to 166. Watch what happens, okay? We're going to go from 165 to 166. So it's 1 over 165. First is 165 times 165 minus a 1, which is going to give us 164. Or says, I'm going to raise all of these things. We know the answer is C. We are done. Versus 1 over, this time around we're going to go from we, we, here we started out with 165, now we go to 166. 166 times 166 minus 1, which is 165. Which is 165. Are you with me so far? And we're comparing this quantity versus that quantity. What do you notice? What we notice is that 165... I don't know what the hell this says. I don't know what this says here. It's supposed to be 164. This is not 144. This is supposed to be 164. 164, because it's 165 minus 1. We're going from 165 to 166. So it's 165 minus 1, which is 164. And this 165 comes from this 165 comes from 166 minus 1. It is 166 times 166 minus 1. And 165, 165 times 165 minus 1. You see, x minus, x times x minus 1. So what we notice here is that 165 appears in bottom of both fractions. It plays no role. 
if we were to multiply both of these expressions by 165, it would drop out. And now we are done. That's it. We are done. What we are left here, what we are left with here is, what we are left with here is 1 over 164 versus 1 over 166. And because 166 is a bigger number in the bottom, it has a bigger denominator. Therefore, this is a smaller fraction. This is a larger fraction. And the conclusion that we arrive at, the conclusion that we arrive at is that if we go from 165 to 166, our expression will go from 1 over 164 to 1 over 166. Our expression decreases. The value of our expression decreases, does not increase. We were looking for a scenario where the value of the expression increases. Here, the value decreases. The value of this expression decreases. We want a situation where it increases, which is why statement number three was not one. Roman numeral three did not appear in the right answer. The right answer was C, which says one and two only. It doesn't have three in it. We're done with the page. I'm not going to start a new page right now. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.